we're here for a presentation related to the exhibition, How We Are in Time and Space, Nancy Buchanan, Marsha Hafif, Barbara T. Smith. Structured around the subjects of bodies, communication, and dwelling, this exhibition reveals the expansive range of pursuits explored by the three artists named in the title for the past 50 years. And in tandem with the exhibition, 11 artists and arts organizations have been invited to annotate or respond to one or more specific works in the exhibition, which has resulted in new artworks, performances, screenings, talks, and other events of which today's program is a part. Michael will speak more to the show, Michael Ned Volte. Um, so I'll keep my remarks super brief, but I do want to thank Adam again, Adam Hyman and LA Film Forum. Mike Kelly Foundation for the Arts has been a critical supporter for this um, program series related to the exhibition. We also received very generous support from the Pasadena Art Alliance for the exhibition and the Michael Asher Foundation. Um, and I do want to acknowledge my colleague and friend, Michael Ned Holty, for the incredible work he's done on this project, his generosity, his incredible insight, and um, just I, you know devotion to um, making this project um, as excellent as it has been and will continue to be. So I'll turn it over to you, Michael, and really look forward to the conversation today with, with all of you. Thank you so much, Irene, and thank you, Adam. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Eber Rodriguez and John Lapont at the Armory Center for their help in facilitating this as well. Um, this partnership with Film Forum, uh, which has been an important part of my uh, relationship to experimental film and um, art in Los Angeles, um, came about uh, it was Irene's idea really to approach Adam and I, I thought it was such a great idea. There was, um, there is quite a bit of video and film in the exhibition, uh, including two works by Marsha Hafif and I believe five works by Nancy, including two videos that were done in collaboration with Barbara T. Smith. Um, I think there's probably about three hours of uh, moving image work in the exhibition, which is a lot to take in in an exhibition format. Um, beyond that, there was also an incredible amount of work that I could not include in the exhibition, um, including a number of works by Nancy, um, as well as other works by Marsha Hafif. And I, I wanted to um, create a program where uh, I could show other things in relationship to the exhibition. Um, alongside that, I, I always knew I wanted to invite a number of artists to make work in relationship to the exhibition or in dialogue with the exhibition that eventually became known as How We Are in Time and Space Annotations. And I um, think very much from the outset, uh, wanted to invite Jennifer West and Bob C. Loish to participate in in whatever that was going to become. And, and through the years of thinking through this exhibition and planning this exhibition and going through a pandemic, um, uh, a, lot has, a lot has shifted and changed and moved around in, in thinking about the exhibition and um, particularly the programming in relationship to the exhibition. So anyways, here we are today and I am super happy to uh, have these three artists with us to talk about their work um, that is uh, currently available and will be available for another week, as Adam mentioned. And, um, and Marsha Hafif died in 2018, which is one of the things that initiated my thinking about the exhibition at the Armory Center. Um, and so uh, I'm hoping we can also uh, bring in Marsha through our conversation today and, and to consider her work as well in relationship to, um, to the program here. Uh, as Adam mentioned, um, we will be taking questions and uh, encourage you to ask um, those questions. And, and we're going to try to allow ample time for that at the end. But if you have um, immediate things, to say, um, uh, please feel free to share them in the, or write them in the chat. 
or whenever Adam uh, uh, initiates the Q and A. Um, I think that's, I think that those are all my opening remarks. Um, I also, I don't, um, there are bios for each of these artists, including Marsha Hafif in the program notes. So um, Adam has kindly shared those in the chat. Um, and the Q&A window is available. Thanks, Adam. Um, Nancy, I want to start with you, and it's a very similar question to something I asked you on Sunday uh, about performance art, but I want to ask you about video because I really think of you as among the first generation of artists in Southern California working in video in a, in a really um, dynamic way and in consistent way. And, and your work has take your work in video has taken a lot of different forms. And in fact, the three videos that are part of this program are all quite different in terms of um, their approach to the medium. But um, I, I'm also aware of the fact that you didn't have a lot of models for thinking about what making video art was or could be. And I'm I'm just I guess I'm interested in hearing a little bit about how you came to uh, start making video in the first place. Okay, well, um, I think like many people working in performance, I originally thought about documenting what I was doing. And I realized almost immediately that if you just point a camera at a live event, um, you might as well just be killing it because it's really boring. It's not the right way to document most performances, although there were a couple that actually kind of worked out okay that way. Um, but when I began, I, I had a, uh, a warehouse studio that was just a few doors down from the um, cable company in Laguna Beach on Laguna Canyon Road. So I just walked down there and said, hey, I understand that I can borrow video equipment from you. And they said, yes, you can. And they gave me, you know, an open reel um, uh, setup to take back to my studio. So um, after realizing that uh, it wasn't really a good idea to try to document something um, that was a live event with an audience present. I began to think about video as like a stage and a stage where you could show things that were details that were very small that you would never really see very well in a live performance event. So that just fascinated me. And also the idea that, that it could reach more people than a live performance could. So that was the beginning and that was in uh, 1970. It all comes back to Laguna Beach with this exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, yes. uh, <laughs> um, I I want to ask you about webs, which um, you know I've I've seen mm -hmm. a number of your works um, over the years, and I certainly um, the California Video Show at the Getty was an important um, introduction uh, to your work and to the, the field of video makers in Southern California in general, um, certainly a number of the Pacific Standard Time shows um, included your work, but Webs was one that I didn't know about until we really got into the, the sort of long process of bringing this exhibition into being and you showed you shared with me so many things and I was so grateful to have that opportunity to see so much of your work and, and, and every work revealed some other facet, I think, for me. Um, uh, so I, I um, Webs really follows directly from the two, two of the videos that are included in the exhibition, um, uh, which are primary and secondary specters and an end to all our dreams. Um, and I, I guess I'm just, I'm interested in, in hearing about it because I, I think, it also includes that web looks like it's a, a sculpture that that you or someone made 
Um, there also is one of your drawings in the video, which uh, I believe is one of the dream drawings. Um, and the, the video has a kind of dreamlike quality in general, but it's also very highly crafted in terms of the narration. And, and it actually recalled to me um, these creatures, which is an important early video of yours in terms of my sense is that the writing came first. And I'm, I'm, this is one of the things I'm curious about. Um, but it also reminded me a little of uh, Wolf Woman, which is a, 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 a photo text work that you put in the exhibition that also has this kind of, um, uh, I mean, it's a piece of writing. It's, it's really an extraordinary piece of writing that, um, you know, tells a story that's essentially a fantasy. I believe it's a fantasy. Um, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm really interested in that aspect of, of thinking about video in terms of narrative and narration and, and how, how webs um, developed in relationship to those ideas. Well, actually, the, the dreams that are in that work um, are, are actual dreams I had. And um, the tidal wave dream was really terrifying to me. And um, also, I was at that time, I was kind of learning to play with certain kinds of effects. And I had um, just gotten um, a temporary job at UC San Diego. And they had a large video studio with um, a switcher. And I'd never experienced um, being able to, to operate it or to do things like that. So that was part that was part of it. It was kind of a personal research as well. But um, I guess I was thinking about responsibility and also thinking about the way that some of us, including me, carry around a lot of guilt, you know, guilt about almost everything. You know, everything is my fault. Um, and just kind of trying to articulate that somehow. Um, can you, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in, in its relationship to uh, something like California Stories, which was done around the same time, which um, obviously did when you were teaching at University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, and you take a kind of cinema verite approach, I guess, uh, in terms of interviewing um, people, Wisconsin people. Um, and it's, I'm interested in that, the difference in those approaches to making video and, and the way you were thinking about using, um, using a kind of documentary mode. Well, I guess um, sometimes video is a way for me to find, find out about things that I'm interested in. I mean, I think in that way, maybe my work is a little bit similar to Marsha's, you know, because I, I felt that her, her camera is kind of like, it's, it's, it's looking at the everyday, but she sees so many details within just the, you know, everyday life and um, uh, her observations are, are so full of detail which is quite wonderful. But um, yeah, in, when, I, when I was in Wisconsin, it was like I, I really did you know, get a lot of uh, comments about being from California. And I, and I thought, okay, let's just get it over with. Let's just get them all together. And I specifically tried to talk mostly to people who had never been there at all. And um, I actually had a lot of fun meeting people and chatting with them. And I think maybe I, changed their minds about California. And then afterwards, of course, it, it, it showed on public access in Madison. So that was nice that people got to see themselves and um, you know, see their neighbors and friends. So um, I guess I think of those two pieces as quite different from one another, you know, serving, serving different purposes. Yeah, I think they're quite different too, um, but they were made around the same time, I think, which which is also interesting. It just, it, I think it speaks to different facets of your, your body of work or your practice um, and the different ways that you're using video. And of course, video is only one of the many media that, that you've used and explored, although you've come back to it very 
um, consistently, I think, and it's been a really important medium for you. Um, the flight video is in some ways also operating in a, in a kind of more documentary mode um, and really, um, you know, follows from a trip you took to Kurdistan um, with others, I believe. And, um, and it also documents a performance by another artist as well. Um, briefly, and I'm, I'm, I guess, in seeing that video, which also I didn't know about until you shared with me, but it, in some ways, it, it seems like it represents a kind of ongoing shift or a gradual shift in your work from, um, maybe specifically following a, an example like Webs that shifts from something that's very personal and. Um, subjective in terms of its relationship to questions around feminism to something that's more explicitly global and political in its in its concerns. Um, do you, is that a fair characterization? Is there anything you want to say about that? Um, well, um, it was really um, amazing to be invited to join um, mostly people from the UK in a trip to Kurdistan twice. We went twice. And this was uh, courtesy of an organization called Art Roll. It was founded by Adelette, uh, Adelette Gar 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 Gariani. And um, uh, so we went, we went and just visited different places and met other artists in Northern Iraq the first time. And then the second time we were asked to uh, make works and uh, Anne Bean is a performance artist from the UK and she had been doing these morning performances where and and she has worked a lot with sound also and she um, uses weather balloons that have harmonicas in the mm. in the mouth of the balloon and then she embraces them and they sing and she sings with them and in this one, um, she was mourning the, the Kurdish women that were lost um, to the violence uh, under um, Saddam, Saddam Hussein. Um, and um, I was aware of the uh, continuation of honor killings, which indeed still continue. And um, so that was one of my main um, uh, goals was to to try to question women there about what was happening and what their thoughts were and uh, like Choman Hardy who is a poet and um, she she talked about um, you know imagine if you took all of the women that were uh, murdered in these honor killings and put them in one mass grave the way you know the the Kurds had honored. Um, people that were killed by Saddam Hussein, and they have some quite extraordinary monuments of, of, of those events. You know, imagine if there was an event for women that this would really raise consciousness. So that was that was part of my, my reason for making that piece. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I'm, I, I didn't know about the harmonicas and the balloons, that's... You can hear it if you if you, mm. if you know it's there, and indeed there was a funny there was I mean it was so interesting to prepare to do things in in this place. Um, so Anne needed hydrogen and you know for the balloons, and so she went around and tried to find it, and finally there were these men that came and they were burning um, rocks of. I think aluminum, aluminum or something and making this gas. And I think it was actually, um, it was hydrogen, it wasn't helium. And I thought, well, I wonder if we're all gonna, you know, blow up with these guys with their flames and their gas, but luckily no, we didn't. Yeah, that, that is a good thing. Um, thank you for that, Nancy. Um, I think I wanna turn to Jennifer um, and, talk a little bit about your, your two films, which are from 2008, I believe. And I'm in our conversations around this exhibition and, and what you might present in relationship to it. Um, I think you were thinking about 
these three artists and and we talked a little bit about some of the thematics of the show and some of the specific works that would be in it and you you came back to these two particular uh films uh from 2008 and um i I'm interested, I mean, I, I I knew them the first time and it was interesting for me to come back to them too and to think about them again in, in relationship to the show and, and and think about your work, which I've known since we were in graduate school together, um, that to see it develop, but also to think about your relationship um, to a previous generation of uh, feminist artists and uh film and video makers and so i'm i guess i'm i'm interested in in how these particular films resonate at this particular moment um some 14 years later for you yeah thank you so much michael and thank you for inviting me and really honored to be included in this group and get to just think about these conversations together um, with the exhibition and also with the works online and just kind of thinking about legacies in film and video, film and electronic arts um, and all the kind of hybrid forms of those and those relationships directly back to performance, but also to various kinds of media. Um, and I think we we were having a conversation um and there was a few things that came up around kind of locality of place which also centered around the beach in some ways right so there was some works in the exhibition that you brought up to me and so i kind of went back to that like what is this relationship and it has a really beautiful relationship even going back to say like maya darren who's obviously one of the icons of avant-garde film in the United States, even though she's not from here, but just in general, let alone as a feminist leader um, within the field. And I saw like a really cool, and I wanna hear from Babsy, if that's like an homage with the flower um, and the shadow to Maya Darren. Anyway, that's another subject. At the end of your video, I was like, oh, this is like Maya Darren homage in the end. Anyway, so, so with these two works, I mean, it's it's in some ways, it's sort of like, it's strange to look back at them myself um, because so much has you know, transpired for me as an artist and the kind of different phases that I went through. And I probably wouldn't be making like nudist skinny dipping films now in my head, <laughs> but I'm like talking to, you know, like, Barbara G. Smith, I always loved your works along those lines. So it's just interesting to think about like, oh, what would I make now versus like what I would make then 14 years ago. Um, but I think um, thinking about it just in the relation to the show, I mean, just what the reasons that I made them at that point were both in reaction to, you know, the news that was taking place at that moment in time. Um, and so the skinny dipping film was around um, David Geffen had spent millions in litigation trying to block a beach access point um, near his beach house. And I have, per I partially grew up in Topanga Canyon and you know, we could never go to the beach in Topanga because it was all private houses. Um, and so we had to go to public beaches around, but when, when in about 1980, it had already moved away I always heard that um, they they destroyed all of the homes along to Topanga Beach, which were mostly like old surfer hippie shacks, like with a long kind of history. And the demolition, and they used the eminent domain law, and that's where Topanga Beach, the public surfing beach, is now. So a lot of people don't know this history because so many new people are constantly coming to California. Um, so I heard about it and through the internet, I was actually able to find photos of this infamous moment where one of the last houses, they were all the houses were being bulldozed and one of the last owners decided to light fire to their house and burn it down just as an act of sort of rebellion instead of letting you bulldoze it, I'm just gonna burn it. Um, 
so I always heard about that and then I was able to find the images of it. So I always thought a lot about it and I actually made another film specifically using that archive of images of the houses that are all gone. So I was thinking about that because they stop at Santa Monica and they stop at Malibu. So I just I wanted to make a piece um, skinny dipping in front of his house. And so I asked three friends do you wanna go skinny dip at night in front of David Geffen's house through the beach access point that did get put in? Um, and so we did that. Um, and then it was filmed by my husband, Peter West, and we lit it all with flashlights and searchlights. And I was experimenting mostly with that time, you know, during that time with sort of taking on these kind of small, sometimes uh, iconic, sometimes not um, sites, public sites around Los Angeles. So this was an extension of that. And I would shoot the film. And then after I would shoot it, I was using this process of, of directly working on the negative in my studio using, um, you know, kind of everyday materials that were either from the site or from the experience of going to the site. So that one in particular, I mean, it's sort of, you know, it, it we, we had Bloody Marys and fried pickles beforehand. So there's, there's a sense of humor in it too. So that's what I use. I use celery and Bloody Mary mix and pickles. And I put that directly on the film. And then I also mixed it with ash from the Malibu fire that had just happened kind of prior to that. So I collected that um, and then used that on the film. So that's what the film became. So, you know, it was just like this um, small irreverent act of, of kind of recl reclaiming a space and a moment and, and an idea um, in that. And then the other film that is in this um, uh, screening, I made around the same time. And, and I, I really love that year <laughs> for myself because I, I felt like I was a little bit more free as an artist and I was just making tons of work. So I think I made, you know, like tw 20 films that year. Um, and I was just making them really quickly because I, and I had a bunch of different series going at the same time. So, and I was also like, when you were talking about um, Bar <clears throat> um, Nancy, when you were talking about experimenting with media, I was also constantly doing that. Um, and I had the opportunity, I wanted to pursue using 70 millimeter film. Um, and I have this way that I, interface with all of my vendors and and kind of try to recycle directly out of the big Hollywood machine. So I work with Photochem and they gave me um, just the cast off remnants of film. So it's this idea um, and really connecting very much to the legacy of feminist art in so many ways. Um, I invited a group of former students who are no longer my students, but um, to uh, make lit prints over several, I think it was just 200 feet of film in this kind of, um, uh, again, like a, a kind of reclaiming of the idea of a rainbow party, which is something that was on the news. Um, and Oprah Winfrey had a show where she had profiled what rainbow parties were. And everybody can look it up if they don't know what it is. Um, but it was part of like the kind of, um, moralistic way that sexuality is looked at in our country. Um, kind of thinking about like the puritanical roots of it, right? And so this was like taking that and just flipping it on it on its head. And I've re I've also redone this idea many, many times in my studio now with different groups of people um, for different pieces. So it's something that has repeated in my work. Um, so yeah, and, and just thinking about this kind of like pleasure and joy with it, with a group of women, it's, and it's a very funny experience to do the, uh, performance together that ends up being the film because, you know, you get covered in food coloring and there's this kind of like joy to it, you know, uh, in the, in the process of making it. Um, and, and it's really, I also am interested in the idea of, of, what it becomes as a projection. So that piece is really specifically meant as a projection and it's projected, it's been projected a lot onto architecture. So this idea of like the enlarged lips, which are shown and used so much to sell things, right? 
and then making them into instead into this like group aesthetic experience, which has nothing to do with that, and then grafting that directly onto buildings. So it becomes like this kissing of architecture. So that's it. And anyway, it was like really just want to say how much I enjoyed watching all of these films and really thinking about the, you know, the possible connections also to the exhibition. So thank you to all of you. Thank you for that, Jennifer. Yeah, I think it's um, 2008 was such a productive year for me too. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I don't know what it was. Uh, what was in the water that year? Um, I, yeah, I think, you know, your, your work is so um, materially rich and specific and, um, and also funny. Uh, but I think it's, I think it's important to, to always connect the, the materiality to the content in the work and how, how topical it is, but also like, like something ripped from the headlines also has this larger relationship to the sort of puritanical history of America and, and uh, the oppression of women in America. Um, and so I, I, I do think that has this really nice connection to Nancy's work too, and the way that Nancy uses humor to um, get at like hard political truths. Um, in some way, as, as different as, as your work looks from Nancy's, I think, I think there's something really important in, in thinking about the way that you're both using humor and, and thinking very, very topically um, about, about the given moment. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy um, you, you mentioned these two works in particular as a way of kind of thinking about the present and I'm I'm always interested in how we can come back to certain works and how they they operate in differently in a specific moment um, and I think it's important it's an important thing for artworks to do is to <laughs> for us to come back to them and, and to think about how they they exist in a, in a in a given context and so I think I think these both feel really um, potent right now there's also a, a work by Nancy in the exhibition uh, that's a, a sort of um, remake of a, a plein air painting by William Went on the California coastline uh, that that um, has you know the gorgeous I, I, iconic California coastline that with this intrusion of um, uh, real estate condominium development kind of lurking in the background and I felt like the the David Geffen beach film had this sort of nice reciprocal reciprocal relationship to that work by Nancy. Yeah, I saw that yesterday. I love how you go up to it and think, oh, this is a like a landscape painting above like at my grandma's house, like above the couch. With yes. <laughs> and then you look a little closer at that coastline and you see what's on it. It's really great. Great work. I love seeing it. Secretly yesterday. insidious. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I love the humor too. Yeah. Um, Bobsy, I want to turn to you. Um, Bobsy's joining us from Vienna. Um, so it's very late there. Thank you for, for being with us. Um, in terms of topicality, um, your work is, uh, your video. Um, can't put it back is um, recent and was made really specifically um, uh, upon my invitation to participate in the exhibition and, and make work in relationship to it. I think in our initial conversations, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, I don't think either one of us were necessarily expecting that you were going to make a video. Um, although you've made videos. trying everything to avoid it. <laughs> right. But you've, you've certainly made videos in the past. So, um, I'm, I'm really interested in just hearing a little bit about how this video came about. And, um, obviously, uh, you know, one of its subjects is the everyday, which I think has this nice relationship to Marsha Hafif's work, um, and the way that Nancy characterized it. Um, but also it's, it's, obviously a kind of document of maternal care 
and um, but also sort of um, ecstasy and boredom of uh, daily life during the pandemic? Yes, definitely. For me, the pandemic kind of the beginning of, beginning of the pandemic coincided with the birth of my second child. So what would usually be a lot of time at home was just more time at home. Um, and so I would say that this film, which took a very long time for me to make because I feel like I'm the opposite of what Jennifer just uh, talked about. It, it always takes me ages to do the shortest videos. Um, so it, it, it spans uh, maybe a few months uh, from the end of 2020 to, to the middle of uh, 2021. And um, I started the vid well, I, I initially didn't think that I would make a video. I, my thinking started at, uh, with looking at the drawings that my daughter, my older daughter made at that point. And yeah, I was trying to make sense of what, how, this is my starting point, but what will I do with that? And through conversations with you, Michael, but also with other uh, friends of mine, I became clear that the only thing that I can make my thinking clearer is to work it, to process it in a, in a video. Um, and it definitely, I, I had doubt, I had doubt moments when I was looking at it and thinking, this looks like a terrible home video. You know, it's kind of the kind of film that nobody wants to see that your, I don't know, your uncle shows you and you're like, why is he showing this to me? Um, but uh, yeah, it also feels like uh, very intimate to me, very raw and uh, heartbreaking and full of love. And so in the end, I, I ended up liking it, although I was not sure that I would. Yeah, I think when you, you had sent me an early draft, um, and and your email subject was something like, I think this is it, maybe. Um, so it felt like, I mean, it 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 felt like um, it was a document of its own coming into being as a video in some way too. That it was yes. like you had collected all these fragments and and yeah. and and found a way to to weave them together in a way that. Yeah. Um, is very rhythmic and musical in a certain way and and doesn't have much language in it. It has a lot of other, it has a lot of sound, but it doesn't necessarily have a lot of language in it. Which is very much uh, the life with these two little kids at home that, uh, I mean, by now, one of them is constantly talking, but back then she was not yet talking mm -hmm. so much. And the other one was just a newborn. So there was always a lot of noise in the house, but more like kind of background noise. And it's true that the work is very much in fragments because, because of the care that you mentioned before. There's always, you have to tend to something. There is always some sort of urgency in, in situations. So you cannot film them or film something, film a scene for a minute or two minutes. It's most of the time you have maybe 30 seconds if you're lucky and then you have to run and do something mm -hmm. so yeah it's very much uh it, it felt very musical to me also in the making like uh like it, like a, a a track kind of that, that i was that i was filming and and singing at the same time um it what what span of time does does it represent so yeah it, i started in the in the end of 2020 and then i finished it in i think may 2021 so yeah but there are there are there are moments in in different houses because we moved in that time too um there's a certain nostalgia for me also now when I when I look at this uh, 
at this video and see the old mm. house and and which is also some sort of like giving up uh, of of the old life and embracing the new one and also just seeing you know the passing of time and and the kids that are not anymore like that and uh, that ha have also different connections because it's a lot for me the video is also a lot about sense making uh, mm. uh, my daughter trying to make sense of what she sees and me trying to make sense of what she does um, making her own rules breaking her own rules me uh, accepting that and working with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the title of the video comes from, um, I guess, your daughter um, trying to put a, a petal back onto a flower and obviously failing to get it back, yeah. Yeah. make it whole again. But it seemed like a, um, yeah, it seemed like a fitting uh, <laughs> a fitting symbol of our of our um, moment that we're in in some way, sort of irreversibility. Um, I actually, you know, it's it's funny. I my last two studio visits before the pandemic were with you and Nancy um, in the same day, back to back. And Bobsy, you were about to give birth, and so it probably was going to be your last studio visit, even without a pandemic. Um, but I think you, I think you had the first pandemic baby of any of my friends. Um, but, and you both lived in purple houses, which I just yes, thought I like such I an extraordinary you. connection. Um, and like, so this, this just feels very magical. And then, and then the world changed really like abruptly after that. So yeah, just, it was, it, it was strange moment for me also because of the fact that it was a pandemic baby that also would have naturally kind of forced us the arrival of the newborn to stay put a bit more than usually yes for me i mean because everything else was okay and we had we were privileged in the way that we could isolate and all of that um it was quite a sweet you know a, a very lonely but also very sweet time so i always look back at this at these first few months uh, in the pandemic also as the first few months of my second child yes yeah. um but also such a scary and uncertain time too and yeah. and and also to try to try to somehow convey that to children without the apparatus of language. <laughs> um, it seems like one of the, the sort of, it seems like a conundrum or a paradox that's in, in, the, in the video in some way, at least in terms of my understanding of the backstory of it. Um, and one that I find kind of personally and philosophically fascinating in a way. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. I just, I want to, um, Say hi to Barbara T. Smith, who is here as well. Hi, Barbara. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't figure that out. Um, nice to see you. Um, I'm. I'm. Uh, Adam just uh, mentioned in the chat, viewers, please feel free to enter questions here. And um, so please do, um, if there's anything you want to know. Um, Barbara, did you have a question? <laughs> Was how to get in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And now I'm here. You made it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so this panel is for the uh, investigation of the video works, right? In the right. <laughs> yeah. So we were also talking about, about uh, we also wanted to talk about Marsha Hafif um, oh. and her, um, there's a, a Super 8 film called Notes on Bob and Nancy, the Nancy in that film being Nancy Buchanan. Um, 
which she made in from 1970 to 1977, uh, probably one of the longest productions on any Super 8 film in the history of the medium. Um, and then there's also a video of, of Marsha's called Beach Rocks Winter from the year 2000, uh, which I believe is the first time it's been exhibited anywhere um, in, the, in the exhibition at the Armory Center, but our, our film program with Film Forum also includes Letters to JC number six, which is one of several videos that, that Marsha made uh, based on a series of letters that she wrote to her friend JC and uh, documents uh, a trip to Coney Island um, with her narration about it. I mean, it's it's kind of a city symphony film in a in a way, um, and and has a really diaristic um, uh, first person kind of point of view. Uh, with Marsha's narration and, and her sort of hyper precise narration and, and accounting of, of her observations. I've said this at, um, to Nancy and Barbara and, and multiple times while talking about the exhibition and Marsha's work in general, but I think all of Marsha's work is about observation and, and uh, essentially noting her place in the world at a given time. Um, and, and I think this video is no different. Nancy, you raised your hand. Yeah, well, one thing that struck me about um, the Coney Island piece was that in the way that the narration does not match the image, although it could have, you know, it could have, is very much like notes on Bob and Nancy, where she's saying that we're doing things and we aren't at all. So it's yes. <laughs> the same kind of disconnect that she creates with that. Um, and uh, I'd be interested to know if she did other pieces um, with the letters to JC, which she published as a book, actually. And he's an interesting person, too. When I was researching, aha, yeah, when I was researching uh, things for my, um, my CD-ROM about um, housing and real estate, I came across his book, which is called Art, Sex, and Real Estate, which I found very interesting, actually. So, um, yeah, what did you think about, um, you know, that floating, you know, of the, of the audio? Well, I, I had a question while watching it, whether or not it was, uh, whether the letter was written first or if the letter was written after she had made the film, because there are actually many more letters to JC in the book than, than films or videos um, from that series. I've, I've seen number six and number 10. Um, and, but there, there are many more letters that, that, comprise that book. So part of me is wondering if she had actually written the letter based on a trip to Coney Island and then actually took her camera and, and retraced her steps in some way. Um, I was trying to identify the age of the vehicles in the, um, in the video because the letter was written on August 26, 1991. And a number of the cars looked like they might've been from the late eighties. I didn't, I'm not good enough at identifying cars to know if any anything was from later in the 90s, but the video is dated 1999. So that's either when she sort of at, edited the video and, and finalized it, or it's possibly when she shot it. So there could be this, I feel like there is this, this mismatch or dislocation in, in time that is very similar to Notes on Bob and Nancy, which, you know, Super 8, um, I mean, that Super 8 film that she made was uh, asynchronous um, and the, the narration um, came later and was recorded later, uh, but according to a script. So they're, they're, they are similar in certain ways. And I, th I think that's a really brilliant observation actually about the, the sort of discrepancy in, in time, but it, it does feel like it's a little out of time in some way too. And I'm also thinking about it as um, really specific New York pre 9-11, I guess, which is 
one of the you know one of the ways of thinking about eras of New York. Um, and even ninety one in New York was very different than ninety nine in New York in terms of uh, pre and post Giuliani. But I you know I think it I think it bears witness to a really specific. Um, uh, image of New York at a, at a moment in time. Um, there, Adam asked, was the letter uh, a fiction? No, I think these are actually actual letters that she wrote to her friend JC. And um, they're essentially unrequited letters, or if, if JC responded, we don't really have those responses. And I think that's part of the, the structure of the um, of the book, and it was something that um, I, I'm trying to remember the conversation. But at one point, I Marcia had given me this book in 2013, and and um, I was also aware of a novel by the Russian formalist Viktor Shlavsky called "Zoo or Letters Not About Love," which is also a series of un uh, unrequited letters sent to. Um, uh, a love interest in Berlin um, who only allowed him to send her letters if he didn't write about love. And, and so I, I, but it was all, it's also this really incredible kind of document of um, Berlin in, in modern, during modernism. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm not sure if Marcia was aware of that, but I, I really love the epistolary format. I'm a, I'm a sucker for that format. Um, and so there is, um, so they're, so they're not necessarily fictional, but I would say they're literary, um, in terms of how Marsha was thinking about them. I think she was thinking about them as pieces of writing, um, that were also actual letters, I think, to, um, JC Masera, who's a, uh, was a, was a friend of hers. Um, there are more questions in the chat, um, and... So uh, this is a question from Eve Luckring that you answered, Nancy, but I'll just, I'll ask it aloud. Um, since so much has changed in the exhibition of video work since you started working, do you have any thoughts on how the embrace of video in commercial galleries has affected what we see being made for those spaces? Uh, well, as I said in in the in the chat, um, you know, and and Martha Rosser wrote about this actually um, in terms of the way that video was kind of like a, you know, it was like an everyday thing that everyone could use and everyone could, you know, present it, and then suddenly it was like the kind of, um, you know making large, making huge presentations that were very elegant and very expensive in galleries, you know, wall size projections with fancy sound. And um, so I think that the commercial world affected video in terms of that. And indeed that was one of the reasons why I wanted to work with Carolyn and make videos that were very small, because I think when you pay attention to something that's small, it changes the way you relate to it rather than being, you know, confronted by this monster, monstrous, huge thing. You know, you're just looking at something really intimate, which to me, I think that video is intimate. And that's why I always preferred it to film. There's something precious about film that, that I am kind of adverse to. Great, thanks for that. Um, yeah, actually before the, in the chat before the talk, <laughs> we were talking about the Pipilotti wrist show and, and thinking about, I mean, it's so much about video at the scale of architecture and in some ways, I mean, so much about, about the body and, and projecting the body at the scale of architecture. Um, and so- yeah, but but she she really invites you in it's not mm. like you have to be in awe of this huge thing it's like she's inviting you 
to uh, you know have the video projected over your body as well so to me that's very very different and then she's got all sorts of things that are that are actually very small or very weird you know the the bathing suit with the tv inside it all that yes stuff <laughs> well there is a, there I, I also observed there was an architectural miniature in that exhibition as well and there are a lot of them going around right now but i think nancy and uh carolyn potter um uh were were the first to do that um uh, well, also in the pipilati show she has the piece that is just this big that was meant to be you know it's like her screaming from the mm -hmm. screen right and you're supposed to kind of walk over it basically you have to know where it is in this show anyway mm -hmm. so she was already playing with that and that's a really old piece of hers you know that's like mtv times yeah right? you know, like a very early. So I think that's sort of interesting because she was playing with that aesthetic too from MTV, I think in the beginning. Yeah. Thank you, that's great. Um, Nancy and Barbara, Adam is um, interested to hear you talk about uh, how you would describe your understanding of Marsha's approach to filmmaking and, and where it sat in her practice. Wow. <laughs> How Nancy's, how I was, how Marsha's um, approach to filmmaking and how it affects our process. Is that what? How it, how it sits in relationship to the rest of her practice. Oh, her practice. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, um, because I think her, 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 I don't know her video, her, um, yeah, video work all that well, but, um, <laughs> fact that it's kind of um, so everyday and um, undramatic and um, basically it's seemingly unstructured. <clears throat> it's a little bit like going to the very beginning of, of, of something. And it seems like her mentality went to the very beginnings of things like, you know, um, how you very might come to um, getting some pigment and um, making a paste and then making some marks on a canvas. I mean, it's, and then just starting with one increment of color after the other, her, it's almost like the, the um, little film windows, I forget what they're called, but you know, it's, it's, um, her way of thinking was so quiet and so um, like undramatic <laughs> that the, the, um, that's uh, how I, th I think it, whatever the question was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that, you know, Marsha took a lot of walks. Um, she walked a great deal. And I think that the video often or the, you know, maybe she also shot some film that way too, but it was a continuation or, you know, um, an expansion of her observations and also all those journals that she kept, you know, very meticulously documenting her observation of things and her collection of words and facts and odd things, you know, it's um, somehow it, it, it feels, it feels to me like a continuum. It feels like, you know, if you look at all the video with the writing and everything, it all sort of comes together and you can, you can understand her practice more fully than if you only were aware of the paintings. Mm -hmm. I think uh, meticulous is a perfect word to describe Marsha, um, but I also think undramatic, Barbara's uh, undramatic is also a really useful description. Um, I'm. Uh, I know both Nancy and Barbara went to visit Marsha in New York in the, in the early 1970s. So, you know, when the three of you graduated from UC Irvine in 1971, uh, Marsha hightailed it for New York and, um, and then lived in New York um, 
exclusively um, until 1999 when she uh, returned to Laguna and, and split her time between uh, Mercer Street and St. Anne's Drive in Laguna. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm so interested in, and I've had, I had the uh, privilege of visiting both of those studios and, and having a sense of um, two different Marshas um, and, and two very different contexts uh, in which she made work. And in the exhibition at the Armory Center, the monochrome painting is from the Pacific Ocean series, which she started when she moved back to Laguna in 1999. And the Beach Rocks video uh, is also from the same time period. And I think it's really like coming back to the ocean and, and the, the West Coast and thinking about her relationship to that locality. Um, but I'm, I'm also really interested in, in New York and the kind of energy of New York and the letters to JC videos seem to capture that in a way, um, uh, that I think is, is quite useful, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if either Nancy or Barbara has, um, anecdotal information stories about, about your, um, your time with Marsha in New York. Mm. Yeah, well, it was um, really a, a, a wonderful um, gift that she was there. And when we went to New York, we didn't have to, we could never, I could never afford to stay in any place I played rent on. And so it was so, and she was such a good friend. It was just great to, um, you know, be able to go and stay with her. And, and she made this, um, New York environment seem um, uh, like we could cope with it, like I could cope with it, because there was this sanctuary of her um, beautiful studio space with these wonderful windows that looked into a um, sort of a um, inner uh, sky-like situation in the building, and um, and then she would make these meals and her way of cooking was so um, much like everything she else she did, very, very precise and with specific ingredients. And, and, and it was always wonderful. You know, it's just great to visit her there. Yeah. She had a large circle of friends in New York and she was very generous. I remember meeting Alana Heiss and going to the clock tower to see some event there with her, um, you know, um, she had a, a broad appreciation, I think, for a lot of different kinds of work. And certainly that, you know, was true at Irvine as well. Yeah, she, she, that's right, I'm just remembering, she would have a group of friends come over when I would visit so that I would get to um, meet, a broader group of um, women that I knew because I, I didn't know very many people at all. It was wonderful. And yeah, I think as as much as uh, my exhibition is is really about the this kind of triangle of friendship between the three of you, it's it's also important to recognize that all three of you have these um, you know, other social contexts as well. And when I visited Marsha in New York, I, I re remember going up to um, ring her, her buzzer and seeing her name uh, on the same, same buzzer as Jackie Windsor and Joan Jonas. And, you know, was, was very aware of her relationship to a completely different context and a completely different group of artists. And, um, at Marsha's memorial in 2018, I got to talk to Alana Heiss and um, the poet Susan Howe and uh, Dorothea Rockburn. I mean, there's a completely, there's a, there, she had a whole New York life um, and, and circle. Simone Forti was in the same building around in the back side. Yeah, that's right. It's, uh, 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 it was an artist co-op that was started by George Machunas. And yeah, so many amazing people um, lived in those lofts. Um, thank you for those, those memories. 
Um, I hadn't seen I hadn't seen letters to JC um, until the last year or so, and um, was trying to get my hands on everything that um, that Marsha had made in terms of her her work in video, because it was a little bit of a it was a little bit of a mystery to me. It was, um, you know, I think. I think I had I had first gotten to know her drawings and then her paintings and um, and even uh, it took a while to actually get my hands on notes on Bob and Nancy and I remember sending it to Nancy. Um, I had a little anxiety sending it to you. I was like, I don't know, is this something you're going to want to see? Of course, you wanted to see it. And um, oh, she 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 had let me see it before, so. I, I had seen it once. I had seen it once. But you know, there's one piece that I would love to see that piece mounted at some point that Marsha made. And it was a color piece that I read about. And then I looked for an image. And I, my memory is that I found an image, but maybe I just imagined that I had found it. But that she had put a television. And, and if you remember old TVs, when they didn't have an input, the screen would be blue and it would be this bright blue color of light emanating. And she put this blue TV in a room that was painted red. And that was her video installation. I just thought this is the most brilliant video installation I've ever <laughs> been aware of. So, um, yeah. And she did that at some point in New York. Yeah, I've never seen it in in person. I would love to see it too. It'd be it'd be easy to replicate it in in her honor. <laughs> any any other questions out there? Our attendees are so polite. Looks like people want us to you, you to read a question and then. Uh, and then answer aloud is one person asking. I think I I think I asked that. There's a oh. question from Eve and a question from from Adam. Erica said, "Just so nice to hear from you all." Thank you. I I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> um. I want to encourage anybody who hasn't had a chance to actually watch the program of videos to do so. It's available for another week. Um, I also want to encourage people to visit the exhibition at the Armory Center. It's up through June 12, and it's open by appointment on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So visit armoryarts.org um, if, you, if you want to go visit the exhibition. There will also be other programming taking place in the coming weeks uh, that will be um, announced soon. When, Barbara, when, go ahead. Well, when you say, um, uh, what was the first thing you said to, 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 to visit the, um, the video? Is that, I haven't been able to do that. Is that in the gallery or is it online? It's online. It's part of the film forum link. Okay. Okay, I'd love to do that. Um, Walter Whittle has a question. Hi, Walter. Um, Hi. And Walter writes, this has been partially answered, but if HD 4K video had been available in the 70s, how would it have impacted the making of the videos in the show? Would it overtake the content? Mm. Mm. Sounds like a question for Nancy Buchanan. Well, I think I said that you know it was um, it was well, it wasn't that cheap actually. The first uh, porta packs, you know, required that people get together in order to purchase them, and um, I I think it was nineteen seventy nine. Um, I uh, I went in with Paul McCarthy and John Duncan, and we bought a big, heavy 
portable Hitachi camera and a three quarter inch portable deck. <laughs> and, and we shared them together um, because we couldn't have afforded to have that uh, by ourselves. And um, so I think that if, if there had been something even fancier, I think it would have been out of reach for, for most artists um, other than the most elite people. And, um, you know, now it's just, it's so um, democratic that, you know, all you need is your little phone and you can, you can make a whole, you know, feature if, you, if, that's, if that's what pleases you, if that's what you want to do. In a way, it almost seems like there's, there's so much out there now, you know, um, there's almost um, too much, I guess. <laughs> And uh, I, I confess that I, I haven't kept up with TikTok or things like that. I, one of my former students, Casey Amos, um, is the son of John Amos, who was on um, Roots. And he made some videos with his dad, which were really delightful and, you know, sent me a TikTok link. So I did watch those, but it's just like there's, there's too much. <laughs> like the guy says in my California video, it's too much for me. <laughs> Nancy, the, the, um, obviously uh, the documentation of Please Sing Along from the performance you, you did with Barbara at the Women's Building in 1974 was shot black and white. Um, and the first version of With Love from A to B also with Barbara was black and white. But you've, you really, I think there's something about your use of color that seems really important and specific and um, the exhibition also includes primary and secondary specters, which is really specifically about those colors and in each scene um, is is based on a, a specific color. But is there is there something you could say about your use of color in video and maybe thinking about sort of, uh, I think a lot of, you know, a lot of early performance video was was really grainy black and white and it had a really specific aesthetic and it seemed like you were interested in pushing it in a, in a really different direction. Well, I was really excited to be able to finally work with color. Um, the first piece I made in color, I think, was these creatures. But, um, but I had this obsession with wanting to um, demystify television, because it seemed to me that television had such a grip on people. And, and I was aware that a lot of children would say, if, if, if they could see themselves on a monitor, they would say, oh, I'm real, as if they weren't important in no, normal everyday life. But when they got on a TV screen, they were somehow, you know, more important. And so the primary and secondary specters, my idea was to show how completely phony electronic color was. And so I would put one, one thing in there that was, a real thing like an orange or a banana that was that color. Um, but then everything else was, you know, um, was also designed to, to be that color. Um, because I thought, you know, it's, it's the, um, you know, the variety that makes it seem real. So that if everything was monochromatic, then maybe I could like break through that, that mystique of it. But then, um, you know, I was aware of image processing. When I made um, webs, I had met Janice Tanaka and she built her own image processor and she um, allowed me to, to use it. And that's the last image of the, the little uh, dolls that are um, floating away in the ocean was through her image processor. And so I was excited about the idea of just taking the signal apart. So, um, I managed to um, have two residencies at the um, Experimental Television Center, which was founded by Ralph and Sherry Hawking in the 70s, the early 70s. It was a place where you could go and you could stay there for several days for very cheap, like $15. And you could just make video 24 hours a day if, if you wanted to. And so that enabled me to to work with very brilliant uh, colorizations 
that were like nothing I'd ever seen before. And so that was, was also very fascinating with that and with using color as like a comment on the image itself. Maybe Jennifer could comment on her her use of the, the materials that that she brought into her work in terms of of color and texture. Sure, I can do that. Um, well, I'm in this position where I when I was in college, I went to the Evergreen State College. It's this very small liberal arts school in Washington State, and when we were making films, so I kind of fell right into this cusp of when you were talking about cable access that's what we were all using and a lot of people had shows on cable access so i have like this form and that's where i first edited after i got out of school because i didn't have access but it was right before people had vhs cameras so we would shoot film only because it was the cheapest way we could still make a moving image and three quarter inch cameras were so huge. And then we would transfer it at our school. So we could shoot it, I don't know, it costs like $12 a roll for black and white. And then we'd process it in Seattle at this lab and then we'd get it back. And then we'd, we'd telecine it, and, which is digitizing it. And we digitized the three quarter inch and then we'd edit tape to tape, which I'm sure some people may remember. Um, so I think, um, for me, that's kind of where I started out in this very hybrid mode with media and my relationship to media just kept changing. So I never had anything that was precious about showing on film. And to this day, I don't show my work on film. I show it as digital um, transfer. So I was always from the very beginning also interested in using the, the process of transferring from analog to digital. So a lot of it like I made a film with a group of people with, um, it was like a collective piss film where I had this film, which was just like an image of um, a Google search for emojis, which I shot on film. And then I took the film itself and then um, collected urine from a whole bunch of people, whoever wanted to come to my studio and take a collective piss with me. And then I corroded the film that way. So a lot of it is like kind of, interrogating like materials into digital internet space, which has always fascinated me, but also like the process of going back and forth between analog and digital forms and really bodily ways of treating film and film as an aged process between, I'm not even talking about color anymore, am I? But anyway, but the idea of like when you digitize it, it freezes it in that moment. And since my films have been very corroded and treated to all kinds of processes, kind of freezes like that's that moment in time, you know, which like acknowledging the physical part of it. Um, but then also treating the telecine, the digitizing process as a tool. So sometimes I would, you know, flip my telecine so that all the colors would be reversed and so forth. So it's using it as a way to, it, for me, it was like really just about the economics of being able to make it um, and show it. Um, but then, yeah, just very different than a lot of other artists who use film who want to show it on film. Um, and I'm actually doing something at the Pompidou and they wanted to show my work on film. So I'm actually remastering these old, old films from very early, even earlier than this onto um, film so they can project them. So it's sort of like, I think it'll be interesting to do it. I just haven't, um, <laughs> I haven't done it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think my, my mother's an artist. And so when I grew up, she made work around, her studio was in our house. And so she was working with things like nail painting with nail polish and like very experimental work with materials. So just when I was a child, I was just around that kind of sense of wild experimentation um, and always kind of, you know, I give a lot of credit to her for being a model of like really um, just being very open to materials and how you use them and really kind of flipping things, you know, kind of conceptually, you know, painting with nail polish, for example, is like, you know, I considered that 
part of a feminist act, right? Like taking something that's considered this kind of additive, you know, maybe crass, um, but inventive process and then using it. So I think that's where a lot of the early kind of play with materials comes from. Um, being around that and understanding like the sensibility because she did a lot with recycled materials also, which I've also done um, in my own work. Um, and I still to this day, I have a really active studio side of the practice. So really using like the studio space. So it, it could have a combination of shooting um, images and then doing processes to them in the studio. And some of that is group processes, but some of it's alone, me in my studio, you know, frame by frame. And I think there's a kind of meditation to that for me, being engaged with the materials. And so the color has become really um, important. And the films that you see, I made a lot of black films, and then I made films with Film Leader, which is just blank film that's painted with gold. And so those were all my early films were made that way with recycled film, um, not the shot film, I was buying film for that. Uh, but just kind of using those modes or kind of, and in recent years, I've got very involved in looking say, like the history of handmade film, right? So like I'm connecting to a whole other kind of history that has its own history simultaneous to, um, filmmaking from the very beginning, like from the, you know, earliest handmade films onward with filmmaking in, in a in a variety of different contexts. And I've done a lot of research and I've been in, like very involved in that as well. So I think that's where some of it is connecting to people. And within the art world, there's a lot of crossovers, say like Carolee Schneeman worked directly in her film strips, right? So you see like where some of the crossover happens um, within the art world into the film world, into the avant-garde and experimental film world, which has a really rich history of handmade film also. Thank you for that, amazing. Um, I am just gonna be mindful of time. Um, I also know it's really late in Vienna. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, I wanna thank all of you, um, Nancy and Barbara, who um, have so often brought their um, amazing stories and smarts to uh, the conversation around the show. Um, and Jennifer and Bobsey for um, your work and your dialogue um, in relationship to the show as well. I'm, I'm really thrilled that we're all here together and, um, excited to um, have this dialogue. So thank you. And thanks to Adam for, uh, and Film Forum for hosting us. <laughs>